friends, welcome to Interviews, Voices of Our Herbal Elders. This is my opportunity to talk to some of my dearest friends, people who have not only influenced my herbal work, but also have had a major influence on the revitalization of American herbalism. Most of us began our herbal work around the same time, in the early 1970s and 80s, when herbalism was still mostly underground, a place where plants actually thrive quite well. I love hearing people tell their herbal stories of how they began their herbal work, who and what inspired them, their favorite plant and healing stories, and I felt that others would be interested in hearing them as well. In fact, I felt it was important to capture these stories before this generation of elders passed on, as we're all destined to do. My welcome guest today is my dear friend and fellow herbalist, Matthew Wood. Matthew has been a practicing herbalist since 1982. He earned his Master of Science degree from the Scottish School of Herbal Medicine and has been a longtime active member of the American Herbalist Guild. Matthew is an extremely popular and beloved teacher who has lectured and taught extensively throughout North America, Europe, and Australia. He is the author of six acclaimed books on herbal medicine, in fact, his books are considered herbal classics. His Earthwise Herbal uh, series of two volumes and the Book of Herbal Wisdom are for many herbalists, myself included, among our most valued and referenced herbal textbooks. Thank you, Matthew, for joining us. I'm so honored to have you here and just be able to talk to you today. Yes, I'm honored to be here. With you, and you're quite an author, too. So during all those years, I guess from the 90s to the, I don't know, from the 80s to the Whatever. Um, I always thought of you as the herbal uh, mother of m mothership of the whole movement. I could always feel your energy kind of keeping us from fighting and stuff. And nowadays, <laughs> when herbalists are fighting more, uh, it's kind of like I know you've retired from the position on the inner plane, guarding over all of us. Uh, so, or else it's just impossible to keep. Uh, uh, everybody in order nowadays. <laughs> oh, they're all so, taking. I I feel really so comfortable. Good. They're taking very good care of themselves. <laughs> we we've done a good work, yeah, and yeah, now good. now it's time to hand the ship over to them. I so yeah. My initial my mystical experience was on Rib Mountain in Wisconsin, the only mountain in Wisconsin, just about eight eighteen hundred feet above sea levels. Not much, but <laughs> but uh, it was Quaker first day school. At, or Sunday school, and our teacher, Francis Hole, was a soil science professor from the University of Wisconsin, and he just was dancing, almost jumping from rock to rock. I still remember it. Beautiful, sunny day, and uh, this feeling just came out of him. Nature is alive. Nature is alive. And I knew it was true. I knew it wasn't, it wasn't just some sort of um, idea. It was an actual attunement to the living nature. And when I was 31, I got to go back to Madison to thank him for that. And he didn't bat an eyelash. He, he was humble. So he didn't say, oh, yes, I passed that knowledge on to you or something. He just said, ah, oh, yes, that was a beautiful day. And I told him how that had made me, you know, form my, you know, whole life that I was, you know, wanted to actually spread the living nature, nature is alive. And then also, um, and that I was doing that as an herbalist and through herbalism. And he said, and he sat back and he's, said, uh, you have chosen well. People crave that connection, but they can't get there. So you will always be in demand. And I was like, oh, my God, I can't believe who but a Quaker elder would tell you that you'd made a good decision to be an herbalist. <laughs> wow, that's so amazing. What a great story. Yeah, you know, I always think it's interesting, Matt, because at a time when many authors and lecturers are practicing armchair herbalists, who offer theories and opinions based on book learning, you have always been an active practitioner of traditional herbal medicine. I know personally that you have helped thousands of people. You know, I, I've known those people that you've helped, and many with very challenging and difficult health problems. And while I know you believe in the virtues of many different healing modalities, your focus has been on preserving and practicing the tradition of herbal medicine 
as a descendant from our European elders and our Anglo-American and Native American heritage. So what set you on that path, if you don't mind sharing, like, you know, that made you focus on that? It made you aware enough to focus on that. Oh, well, when I was two weeks old, when I was a week old, my dad was unemployed. He got a job as a teacher for the BIA, Bureau of Indian Affairs, and they only had a few positions open. And one of them, I don't think they were the choice ones, but it was a great location. So he became a teacher in the one-room schoolhouse on the uh, Big Cypress Indian Seminole Indian Reservation in Florida, 50 miles by dirt road, and I mean a dirt road had been only in for two years, um, to the nearest town, yeah, in the Everglades. And um, the English was a second language for everybody, even the littlest children. And um, they had only been in treaty relationship with the U.S. government for 18 years in 1954. So, I mean, they were like, you know, really from another dimension. And, you know, Indian communities, as many people know, are empathic. So you just kind of live inside a fishbowl of of everybody being related. And um, also their language doesn't have the syllogism or logic of um, of Greek, Latin, English. Um, and so they just say, in that type of language pattern, you just say what you experience, or you don't say anything. As my dad would say, if two Seminoles hadn't met in 20 years and they passed each other on the path, they wouldn't say anything, unless they had something to say. To say. <laughs> And because and, they had that, you know, just honest, straightforward. So there was that. And then behind that, you know, then the medicine people and stuff, uh, I, you know, they were a small band. They didn't really have too much in that way. But um, you would speak um, by word plays, by um, in archetypes, basically, which can't be expressed exactly directly, um, but only in sort of by inference, by um because it's a hidden world. So so that was so I thought that way and I didn't really realize why or how or what to do with it until I was about 18, 19, and I always thought astrology was ridiculous and then all oh, the stars can't have any influence on us. And then somebody did my chart and um she she totally convinced me. And I saw first I saw that um, astrology was a language of energy patterns or archetypes, and I needed that so much that I dropped out of college and studied astrology and Jungian psychology, which actually I concluded was based on astrology. I, I hate to say it, but I really think it is. And um, and the two enrich each other. I studied that for two years almost. Oh, I studied for a year nonstop, and after a year I could talk to... See, I couldn't really talk to people up till then. I just couldn't say any of my thoughts but the most mundane and after a year, I could talk to other astrologers, and I thought, well, this is great, but I have to learn how to translate this into English. So then I, I set about for the next year translating astrological concepts into English. So my, I'm always thinking in those, those archetypes and translating from that into English. So, so that was <laughs> that's my <clears throat> actual education. I did go back to school. It took me 14 years to get my degree, <laughs> bachelor's. And as you say, I got my uh, master's degree at the, the Scottish School of Verbal Medicine, which uh, was accredited by the University of Wales about 2002 or three, And um, that was worth it because they taught me how to read scientific papers. And at least I know how to do that. And it, um, mostly I just read the abstract and skip to the... Um, <laughs> do you find those scientific papers really valuable to read? Just out of curiosity? No. <laughs> Mostly no, yeah, and um, <laughs> um, and also in my last book, which you gave a good, um, uh, um, a nice um, back page, uh, yeah. back site uh, review of um, uh, holistic medicine, the extracellular matrix. In my introduction, I I went through how just all the ma major voices of medicine are saying that the that you know basically. Um, the media, the the medical media is captured by the big pharma. That Martha Marsha Angel from the uh, New England Journal of Medicine, she said by 2003, she was saying, you can't trust anything that the drug companies put out. Uh, John Ionides put out a really important paper about 2002 or three that that medical and even scientific research didn't 
prove anything 70% of the time because the statistical models weren't weren't good enough. He was a statistician. And then even Richard Horton, um, editor of the, the um, Lancet, still editor of the Lancet, he, he said he was shocked. He came back from, uh, uh, you, you can just tell he's in shock. And he says, I, I, at this conference, they said up to 50% of all science is bogus. And again, the drug company is interfering. It's only gotten worse. So, so um, one has to be very careful. Um, I think anything involving profit is uh, far along. Of course, as as you know, there's a lot of nice papers from Pakistan, Iran, Turkey, um, Saudi Arabia um, on herbal medicine. Poland is maybe one of the few European company, countries still doing a lot. I mean, Germany's always doing some. So there are good herbal papers that are worth knowing sometimes. Yeah. Well, that's and amazing. and there'll be review papers which have all the uses. Yep. Yeah. So, but. Tradition, tradition. You know, I I love whenever I talk to my fellow herbalists, I'm always astounded by the absolute absolute brilliance and the willingness to think outside the box. And always, even since young children, you know, like I think of you and William Lasseyer and David Hoffman and Stephen Buter and just on and on these brilliant minds that just were able to travel and come back with this information. You're definitely one of them. So here's a kind of simple question, but I really always love hearing this. Is there a defining moment? And maybe it was this moment that you spoke about with your professor, but when you knew you were going to be an herbalist and were on the plant journey, is there is there like kind of a spark that you remember about that time? Yeah, I guess at that time, I still didn't know I was going to be an herbalist. I was 10 or 11. He was Sunday school teacher. Um, but when I was 13, I read The Teachings of Don Juan by Carlos Castaneda, which was so important to all generation. It was the summer of 1967. And Classically, it was given to me all dog-eared by a guy who was on the run from the army who was going to Canada. I mean, this is just typical, you know, 1967. <laughs> and uh, so I read it and I said, oh, plants have consciousness and they're more reliable than humans. Humans are changing all the time, but plants, they retain, you know, after 100 million years, they make a, a little uh, shift maybe. And uh, like hawthorns and apples split apart a hundred thousand years, hundred million years ago. That's what I meant, not a hundred thousand. And um, so um, they stayed the same for a long time, and they're reliable uh, reference points. So right away, I would say I was already in the idea, which it, you know, so many people were in our generation, and then since then, of you know, plant attunement. I, I didn't know how to do it. I didn't attune to plants at that time, but I. Um, well, knew that plants, that there had to be a way to understand the consciousness of plants. And I wasn't really particularly interested in hallucinogens because I knew regular plants would have it too. So so at age 13, I determined to be an herbalist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And at age 17, I started, that's when I first actually got some herb books, I believe. Actually, my dad got them. It's kind of like, you know, parents, sometimes they tune into what their kids are doing. And then so they study it and then they pass it on. And uh, so good. Uh, and one of my first herbals, my first one of my favorites still is uh, Ben Charles oh, Harris, yeah, The Complete Herbal. Yeah. Yes, me too. Yeah. Yeah. I always regretted that, that we weren't, that he didn't come, that he maybe didn't live long enough to come to any of our conferences of the younger generation. I don't really know, but he was in Massachusetts. So Yeah. I mean, we did try to gather up as many of the elders as we could. Um, but I think that he was like, back, that would have been like 1980. I think he might have been either quite elderly or maybe just on the other side of the country. So I never had the chance to meet him. But I love some of those old classic herb books. You know, I'm so glad to hear you met them. Yeah. So good. I love that your father was so, yeah. and he would actually get you herb books. Well, he got them for himself. But see, now I realize <laughs> that he was actually tuning into what I was tuning into. Yeah. And it was an interest for him for a couple of years. Now, now then, no, he's still alive and my mom at 93 and 92. And they attribute their uh, still being alive to following my herbal and homeopathic um, uh, yeah. path. And um, they pay attention to the doctors much more <laughs> than um, 
the, nowadays, but that's all older people um, tend to do that more and more. Even I go, since I got Medicare, I, I, go, I go to the doctor once a year, <laughs> <laughs> but I pretty much He's gotten used to the fact that I reject everything he says. But. Yeah, yeah. You look like you're in radiantly good health, Matthew. Yeah, you know, so for most of us, I am. yeah, look, yeah. For most of us, there, there's a moment or many, many, perhaps many, many moments. And we just feel that the plants, you know, called us, called us to them. Like there's this aha moment. Um, do, do you have a one of those stories that you wouldn't mind sharing with us? Well, let's see. I my uh, one aha moment I had, so I studied botany because there was no way to study herbalism at age 18, 19, 20. And there was dear old Dr. Lawrence. So this was professor and he taught, I mean, this is pretty crazy. This old guy, he taught um, ethnobotany seminar on hallucinogenic plants, which was like, you know, <laughs> really fun in the early 70s. And <laughs> and we had various people who had done drugs show you know, give, give testimonies. But at any, I was in a field botany class by him, which is a hard class to, that hardly exists nowadays, and it barely existed then. But um, I did a paper on my favorite plant, the bur oak, which I understood from astrology was so Saturnian, and and I really understood it in a way. And, and at the end, he said, because I still didn't speak well then, he said, well, you're not a very good speaker, so you get a B for your oral presentation, but you really understand the essence of that plant, so you get an A. And I was like, holy cow, somebody gets what I'm doing, you know? <laughs> and uh, and that was Dr. Lawrence. He was like that. So that was, um, and and to have someone like kind of tell you what you're doing is also helpful. Like, I, you know, so it was like, wow, somebody understands me, but I also have his testimony. I see that's what I am doing, you know? So, yeah. And I couldn't tell if I wanted to be an astrologer or an herbalist until I was about 28, 29. And I did work at an astrological publishing company. And then, but I, I realized I didn't want to do that. And then a little herb store was starting in South Minneapolis, Bob Gallagher, Present Moment Herbs. You might have visited there at some time. And he hired me. I was, that was 1981. I worked just one day a week. And then, you know, a year or two later, two, uh, five days a week. I could never really work more than 30 hours a week. I, I mean, I was always my own person so much, you know, so I was, starving but starving artist but uh then i and for the first year i was afraid to practice i didn't do anything also i studied um homeopathy first and in fact so my cousin uh julian winston who's well known in homeopathy but he's been dead for about 15 years but he lived in philadelphia and he was a big wig in, in the homeopathic revival and and i got from him i got the address of the homeopathic everything was hard mail in those days you know i got the address of the homeopathic pharmacy in Philadelphia, Borky and Taffel. And uh, I was just going to send off to get a home remedy kit. And my dad said, oh, why don't you get one of those for me too? My Uncle Rushmore had one of them. And I was like, what? You didn't tell me that. Uncle Rushmore had a home remedy kit? And we discovered, so we knew that my grandfather had been um, delivered in 1900 by a Quaker, they said chiropractic physician, but there was no chiropractic in 1903. It turned out when we put it together, it was uh, homeopathy. And later, one of our friends in the Quaker meeting there, his mother came to visit, and and his mother's father was that physician, was a Quaker homeopathic physician in Trenton, New Jersey, in 1900, and was a cousin of my I grandfather. Totally. And she got up. Well, I have his records. Let me see if I can find that. And she said, Yeah, he was the family doctor, but. He was out of town, so his best friend, who was a Quaker homeopathic physician, delivered the baby. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. I found I had these um, things, and actually, this is for a bibliophile, and you're an author in a bibliophile, too. So so there's a classic home remedy book of 1800. Like, I wanted to find out. I wanted a copy just to see what were people doing in those days. So, So I... Ordered one online. I thought, okay, I want under hundred dollars, hundred dollars or less, and I want. Oh, I can get it for pre something from the seventeen hundreds before before eighteen hundred. That will look good on the title page. And so I find I ordered one, and it, it came in. And I opened it up, and there was the signature of my great 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 grandmother's uncle and her father or brother. I couldn't tell. They had the same name. Yeah, and um, Quakers again. 
No, no. So from 1774. So I had the original family <laughs> of, of Earth book from way back then. You know, I, I don't know how much they used it, but I was like, wow. You know, the other thing that you said that struck me is how, you know, when you were recognized for that work that you did in herbalism by your teacher, that it, you know, it kind of confirms that you're not alone in the world, that they're like, I've heard that from so many of our friends, you know, it's almost like so many of us were kind of odd when we were children. We didn't quite fit in. And then we found like a tribe and we, you know, we all had a very different ideas, very different mindsets, but this commonality of love for the earth and the plants. And we found a language, you know, that able to speak and be understood. It was, it was such an aha moment for all of us, I think. Yeah, it's beautiful. Oh, yeah. It was so great to meet up with other people. And I, you know, I, I can't say I was as surprised. I felt, it just so, felt so natural looking back on it with you now. I'm thinking like, wow, yeah, it was so special. But um, it was like just natural when I, I think I went out. Well, first I went to, uh, oh, in those days, they had the Frontier Herbs yes, in Iowa. Yeah. I went to one or two conferences. I attended the speaker. And then um, Pam Montgomery invited me out to Green Nations in the early 90s. I met William Lasassier there. But I remember how, I mean, everybody seemed compatible. It was like there was hardly anybody that, you know, seemed like they didn't fit in. No, so. they all, we all <laughs> So. There was room for everyone, right? It was like <laughs> all of us. We found home. That was so incredible. Well, you've mentioned several teachers that you've been inspired by already, but is there is there one teacher in particular that influenced your life's work? Well, yeah. In addition to growing up on that res till I was two and then spending time on another res later on, and always, and I went to school in South Minneapolis, always had Indian, uh, Friends, we we just had our fiftieth um, anniversary um, high school graduation. I talked to one of my friends that grew up in the in the projects, and he said, "Oh, you got beat up by Myron R too, huh?" <laughs> well, that's you know that's life of a boy growing up in the city. But uh, so I can't I can't remember why I got out of that. But yeah, so many of my early teachers were Indians. In fact, all of them were essentially, except for Bob Gallagher, the owner of the herb store. I learned a few things from him, but I was more of a homeopath then. But yeah, so I learned, I would just, sometimes I just learned two or three herbs. And actually in the native world, that is kind of, you know, somebody knows two or three herbs really well sometimes that, that and, you know, and there's not as many practitioners that know tons of herbs, but Finally, when I was, I can't remember why, I was in my 30s, I'm pretty sure, and I met a guy named Tismal Crow, who was a Muskogee, and got, we were like blood brothers or like uh, like herb bros, and uh, we just, for I think the first five years we met, we just loved teaching together and carrying notes and, and uh, you know, learning, and, and it was somewhat psychic too. Uh, later, it turned out, it turned, this is kind of unbelievable, uh, later, I had a falling out with him and him with me, and uh, and I was talking about this with Phyllis Light, and he, and um, and after about forty five minutes of my explaining it all, she said, "What? Well, you know, this sounds like this guy who used to live in Arab, her little town in in Alabama, named Spider." And I said, "Yeah, that's one of his aliases. Yeah," and <laughs> and she knew him too, and then I realized like he knew a lot. She and he had some herbs, three or four really in common that were not that well known. Use of bone set for bone setting, uh, Solomon Seal, a few others um, that I realized were due to his living in that same area, knowing kind of the same things. But he and I, we must have, we exchanged a lot. I remember, and I learned a lot of Indian medicine from him. And uh, and he learned, and he, uh, he said to one of my friends, he did say it to me, I never learned so much Indian medicine since I left uh, home which was Michigan for him and from me, from Matt, as I did from Matt. So, so we learned, we had a similar way of thinking, uh, you know, it's like the medicine animals and the nature is alive. Certainly. I know you've always spoken about him with such respect. Yeah. So that I would call him my main teacher, also peer. And then the first, um, maybe herbalist I met that I learned a lot from was oh, William yeah. Lasassier. William so, comes up in all yeah. of our conversations, you yeah. know, <laughs> that man had, such a profound influence yes. on American herbalism, didn't he? Yes. Yeah, everybody learned from him. And um, uh, he was humble, as you know, and um, yet great, <laughs> you know. And, I mean, he was a great herbalist. 
and he was other dimensional. Like I went to his um, memorial, and someone described um, they were at a lecture by him on body work, and and the and he was working on the woman's head. She was on the uh, on the stage on a on a um, massage table and working on her, and she started to float up into the air and floated about a foot and a half up, and then and then floated down and back, uh, and then he said. And when she got back on the table, he said, "There, I think that's enough." <laughs> that's not an uncommon story about when you. That's, that's, no, it's totally true. I think that, I think that people would say the same for you. You're many multi-dimensional, Matthew, and also I think there are many stories to be told. We'll get into those of so some of the healing that you've seen done and done yourself. But I wanted to ask you though before we got to there, I, I know you have uh, a workshop actually coming up and. Uh, about women's roles in herbalism. And I also know that you have very deep respect for, for women in herbalism. So would you just share a little bit about um, what special roles that you think that women play in herbalism? Yeah, well, let's see. So actually, you guys are the majority in this profession by far. <laughs> I'd say in my experience, well, nine out of 10 herbalists are women. Nine out of 10 of my students are are women. Nine out of 10 of my clients are women. And even the one man who's dragged along often turns out because his wife wanted him to come and or or mom maybe and uh so women are you know and then women I'd have to say are more badly affected by drugs so they are more alternative i don't know what the statistics are for how many people are into alternative medicine i think it, at one time it was about 15% higher, i think yes. it's actually higher right now but um yeah if if it was say 25% of the country, maybe 30 is, well, I'd, that's my guess. Um, I'd say it's probably 40, 50% of women and, you know, 10, 20 of men, you know, more. So uh, there certainly are many men, you know, and, um, uh, you know, and then, and I do have, to, it's, it's a little disproportionate when we get to conferences and stuff, men have more kind of like, uh, you know, chutzpah to get out there and write books and be a teacher and, the uh, ego and um, you know for better or worse that helps you teach and but women are the soul and um, when they do achieve a lot like you and Susan Weed for instance I mean that's a lot what you guys what you two have done is like incredible amount um, really more than any man I can think of because because you really were the soul of herbalism for decades and really kind of you know, kept it somehow, you, you just, you had that vibe that I, I could always feel that out in the herbal atmosphere. And I felt like, like it kept us from fighting. And I, I think of some of the big egos, none of them named, all of them really good people, dedicate, all of them dedicated to herbalism, but we could have fought. Um, and we didn't. And uh, I just think that's the, the example that you gave and also your vibe somehow this i call it cloud medicine just kind of the vapor going over the whole landscape and, and keeping us all in order so that was a contribution from you plus you just always had an eye for who was kind of really interesting in the field and brought them to and, and great conferences that you did the international spectacular and, and who would have thought of that i i mean i i just i was like wow an international herb symposium somebody can pull that off like <laughs> but rosemary <laughs> yeah and then susan weed you know I mean, on the one hand she created on the other hand she brought out of the myths of history you know wise woman herbalism which um there's a lot of herbal female herbalists who do not do the nurture thing i, I had a i was on her program one time and you know samuel thompson's mentor mrs bent and she'd give one herb after another until it raised a sweat which is totally not you know nutritive herbalism and i i said well there's a wise woman that was not a wise woman herbalist you know <laughs> and actually you know the the mother of the you know spec i mean herbally speaking uh literally of uh thompson who was so important in the american herbal movement so you guys have provided the soul and yeah it's phyllis and myself i see they put my name first i've got to correct that they should put phyllis's name first and Phyllis, of course, is ideal. Phyllis and you are some of the only women who grew up with mothers or grandmothers who taught them um, herbal medicine. Both of you, I think, yeah. is your grandmother. Yeah. And if I remember, yeah. And um, I mean, you learn things like cupping and um, 
um, just old country, I mean, which is really valuable. There's so many young people whose parents now are our age, right, who are teaching those young people. So we see an entire new generation who are learning from their oh. elders because they've all been trained by us, you know, or by other herbalists uh. of this generation. So we're seeing it, um, that tradition uh. actually growing. It's so good. Yeah, going yeah. on and on and on. Yeah. And we are really well established. They could try to make us illegal, but we would not disappear yeah. by any means. Well rooted. You know? We're well rooted. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, that's incredible because you do remember the days yeah. when I know you were persecuted just for even having an herb store socially in Sebastopol or that area, Gurneyville, but um, but also legally, you know, and then that's what I felt in present moment herbs. Um, for the first year, I just kind of, I didn't do anything. I was like, Bob can practice, you know. He already sold dope, so he was already a lawbreaker. But, <laughs> but, and I got to say, he was ahead of his time because he would love it nowadays when that's legal, you know. <laughs> uh, he wasn't, you know, he wasn't just trying to make money or something. He, he just was a natural lawbreaker. <laughs> he just didn't want to conform. But so that's the kind of person I had to have to begin practice with in the herb store. After a year, I started giving advice and more and more. And I'm really glad. I don't know. And, you know, it's kind of funny. One thing I learned from him, how to take a case, like like he would always measure the person as he was talking, like before he'd commit himself. Like if you're illegal as an herbalist, you know, as well as a dope dealer, then, you know, you assess. It's like, where is this person coming from? What's their, what do they really want? Which is really important. And that that's important before you even start an herbal um, before you really get into asking what the thing is nowadays I don't really have trouble with that but in those days I'd occasionally you know ha worry about someone or they were I thought they were maybe litigious or or they were you know or they were some kind of agent but um, that might have been my imagination I can say for the first 15 years I was afraid every day I, I woke up I was afraid oh. I was going to get arrested I didn't realize they don't really arrest <laughs> You you go did you go no, through that too? No, really. I was always no. <laughs> bold. I never worried about it. In my herb store, I just whatever anybody came in, I just like if I could help them, I would. I never worried about it. I started worrying about it when other people started working for me, you know, for their sakes. So I would always say, you know, try to share with them that it's better to be really careful. But in those days, even like with formulas, even when I was using herbs that you know were like sassafras that you weren't supposed to put in formulas. I would put it in and I just put a statement right, right, right on that. The FDA doesn't approve of this, but it's actually perfectly safe. <laughs> I put it in my catalog and everything. So I was just lucky that, you know, I was kind of like trying to wave a red flag and thankfully everybody avoided it. They didn't pay any attention. I think it was just such a small red flag that nobody really cared. One thing I noticed, so we had our little hippie herb store, I'd call it, and it's like, like I know that was offensive at first in Sebastopol, hard to believe, but but for the FDA, like I think that actually disarmed them. They didn't really care. Oh, there's a bunch of hippies. Oh, they're not trying to appeal to science. God, they believe in astrology. Ha ha ha. That protects you. It's like when you try to be real scientific that they really go yeah. after you and hate you. Yeah, you know? I think that so. is true. You know, so we <laughs> talked about this yeah. earlier, is how so much of your work, you teach and you write, yes. But so much of your work has really focused, you've been, you know, you have been a practitioner, really. And I know whenever I would have you come, those wonderful times when I would have you come to Sage Mountain and you would teach at my advanced programs. And those were always very special weeks. But people would drive for literally, they come from states away, you know, to see you for consultations. So I'm just wondering if you have a story of like, I mean, I've heard stories that I have what I'm going to share with you that I have seen you kind of work what I call a miracle, but do you have any particular story that you want to share about how the herbs work through you? Or yeah, let's see. So one I remember um, from that I, I hope it's not the story that you have that I treated. So someone came to me, see me or I was in the class at your place and she was 42 and she wanted to get <laughs> pregnant. And really, as you know, really, because um, I know because of your mail book that just juicing people up, getting, you know, at that age, Sapa Meadow, Burdock, uh, various things that are juicy really help a person. And, you know, and in addition, I looked at her tongue and took her pulse, whatever I could tell. So I said, um, so she was pregnant 
within five days. <laughs> and, and what made this story even better was that I had a client years later. She was 29 and she'd been, they declared she $10,000 in, this is like 15 years ago, $10,000 in fertility treatment to no avail. She already had one kid. They wanted to have another. And her mother and her had both, well, the doctors called it premature um, menopause that they stopped menstruating by age 28, 29. So, and her mother, it had been the same thing. Well, to me, again, that's just getting them, um, juicing them up on remedies. And this, I do remember that I gave her burdock and um, I did have some true unicorn root, which is famous for that, which I had a very little stock that I'd had, which I still have some. Oh, I found a two ounce of from 1895 uh, true unicorn root in a in an antique store. It's like, oh yeah, my I'll God, take that. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, so I gave her that, and I joked about yeah. how this, <laughs> I joked about how this woman had got pregnant within five days, and she called me back later and she said I got pregnant within five days. <laughs> yeah, that's really amazing. Yeah, cause that's always so traumatic for women, you know, for families. It's really, that's a, that's a beautiful, beautiful story. I have a story. Yeah. I, I shared this story so many times, but um, it was also a time when you were at Sage Mountain and we were all outside and we were in the terrace gardens there, all those rock terrace gardens. And you were teaching. It's a beautiful sunny day. Yeah. And Cheryl, who's one of my really good friends, and she's this really hearty, strong, you know, Vermont woman. She's lived in Vermont all her life. She just stepped on that stone wall wrong and she came down and she just, we could hear her ankle like, you know, just crunch. And right away, it just started swelling, getting really big and black and blue. And you very calmly, every, we're all huddled around her, you know, like you very calmly said, go gather some elder and yarrow, you know. And everybody scampers off and comes back. And you just, you make a poultice and you put it right on her. We're all just sitting out there. You just put the herbs on her. And then you keep teaching. And literally, I mean, like, so... She couldn't even walk when that happened. You know, she was down on her knees and sitting there. And, and really, I would say in about 40 minutes, I usually say 20. I really think it was more like 20 minutes, but we'll stretch it to 40. Her ankle was, all the swelling was out of that ankle and she got up and walked on it. It was like, I'm looking at her going, so it's not just the herbs. It's also something that you did with those herbs. I'm sure of it because I've used that. I've used elder and yarrow many times after that, and it does work really well. But somehow I don't have the juju with that combination. Yeah. Do you remember that time, Matthew? I do. I didn't remember. All I remember is, yeah, with the stone walls and something <laughs> happened, and I did help somebody. That's all I can remember. But no, that's great to have that story filled in. Elder is good when there's puffiness around a joint, so that's why that went in there. And of course, yarrow, um, you know, there probably was a hemorrhage in there, and uh, so that would make a lot of sense there. And you know, I I like elder uh, yarrow better than yes. arnica, even. And you know, nothing could have shaken my faith in arnica as a younger practitioner, yeah. except yarrow. I like yarrow <laughs> so better too good. because yarrow is so. always around. <laughs> Arnica's around sometimes, but yarrow is always there. You know, the other thing that you kind of have brought, I think you you probably are the one who re um, you know, who really brought the idea of dose dropping, you know, like one drop. But I, I remember one time I was sitting in on one of your consultations and you you put a drop on a Kleenex or something and gave the lady that, like, you know, just a hold or something. It was like not even in her mouth. I'm going, this is not going to work, Matthew. But sure enough, like in 20 minutes, that woman is looking at you going, my symptoms are feeling so much better. And she meant it seriously. She wasn't wasn't like placebo from her. So do you want to share a little bit about that? Um, well, actually, so I don't like politics, but um, it's political. Because when I was young in the herb store, there was the flower essences, the herbs, and the homeopathics. And of course, as you know, there's some homeopathics like Hypericum, St. John's Wort, uh, Eupatorium, Boneset, Elder, Sambucus, that are in both. And you can pretty much see they're used the same way. And um, in fact, we sometimes learn from them and them from us. So I didn't like the idea of like people thinking that the plant properties depended on how they were prepared. So I wanted something that was kind of between all of them. And that was drop doses, one to three drops was kind of my standard in the old days. One of my main students, full-time herbalist in Minneapolis, Lise Wolf, she still uses one drop 
a lot of the time. I've kind of loosened up. I'll use, and definitely if an herb is kind of nutritive, I'll go to 5, 10, 15, occasionally 25 drops, um, oat grass or um, milky oat seed rather, or things that are more nutritive. Um, nettles, certainly taking tea. And actually, I have been converted to some of um, Susan Weed's um, quart jar um, decoctions or infusions. <laughs> yeah, yes, right. Yeah. So that was kind of, I just didn't want people to think, I wanted to kind of prove that herbs work no matter which system. Um, but okay, if you use them in the small dose, though, they're more, um, they act on the immune system, which has, you know, which is very finely tuned. T cells, there's I, there's actually a little teeny bit of uh, research on this by Harmit Heine, H-E-I-N-E, and someone else, a uh, German, he was associated with Tramiel, so he had a bias. Um, but the bystander, bystander reaction loop is how the T cells um, trigger get triggered, and and it's and they found you know one part in a thousand they could get a response to a toxic or non toxic really? herb, and um, so yeah yeah so that's only been done once but um, um, with three herbs but um, that's one way that herbs work but another way as you know like is a mucilage or an astringent very topically uh, both internally and externally just really changes things and really acts fairly mechanically i'd say that you're not using the essence you're using the mechanics of herbs and you can get intuitive and good at either method either method i think you have to be intuitive um <laughs> strange to say and um i'm not very good at the use of large herbs although I've been studying Samuel Thompson of late, and I, it's like, wow, some of these things, I mean, some of the yeah. stuff he treated was like unbelievable. I wouldn't dream of it with a drop dose, like a guy with a pitchfork tine stuck in next to his eye into his skull. Like he kept him sweating for a week uh, in a little, you know, those houses in those days yeah. are the size of your smallest bedroom and kept the stove going and sweating. And he, you know, by the end of the week, he was getting his vision back. The blood was starting to drain out of the area. I mean, it's like, and that's just one of his case histories. So it's like, wow, that was by understanding how to manipulate sweat, heat, and water. And he also believed in getting rid of the canker, the ama, the um, mucus um, deposits on the membranes. Yeah. So, so very impressive, very different. And very intuitive, though. It was clear. I was like, this guy knows what he's doing. I think this guy knows what he's doing, too. Yeah, it's been amazing to watch that, you know, just the so many practitioners now use that. It's, it's pretty, yeah, it's amazing. So do you have any special plant allies that are just like your special friends that you always call on that are always there for you? Well, Solomon Seal, which, as you know, we've discussed, is a little bit environmentally uh, challenged. So if you're going to use Solomon Seal, you should plant it in your garden or I would say probably, I think it's okay to buy the Chinese Solomon seal because I think they've been growing it for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. If you know huge beds of it, yeah, we'll pick some, but um, don't advertise them. And it appears to me Solomon seal is best known and used by kind of small farms and stuff for the people selling the, the salves and things. So that's one of them. Yarrow, you couldn't be an herbalist and not like yarrow and elder. And oh, and I know, and you'll find this so true and funny. You know, no matter what your philosophy of herbalism when, is when you start, and if you're a guy, then you're more like, rr, 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 you know, but no matter what it is, after 15 years, all herbalists agree. They, you know, they all kind of say, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, great. You know, I mean, <laughs> and they all kind of know the same uses and they all kind of think the same way. We're kind of mechanics and philosophers. <laughs> and I mean, I've seen this again and again that like, you know, uh, there's some people that want to, you know, hold their own road maybe, but um a row, but uh, mostly people just end up in the same place. And it, so it's an empirical art that is experience-based art where you end up in the same place because it's the uh, innate truisms of mother I nature that. and that's the plants. Beautiful. So that's a, that's a really beautiful statement. What about nettle? Is nettle one of your. Oh, <laughs> yes, of course. Yeah. Uh, and of course the great David Hoffman's <laughs> statement, when in doubt, use nettles. <laughs> <laughs> with I know. <laughs> it's like a bumper yeah. sticker. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's yeah. that would yeah. be good. Or a t-shirt. Be yeah. Right. Ah. 
uh, yeah, my insurance agent of all people, he his, he married somebody who was kind of an herbalist or body worker. But he said, yeah, I went to, we went to England and I dislocated my shoulder. Great big guy like me. You know, so when you really throw it out, when you're big, you really throw it out. And, and uh, I went down to the local pub and said, well, is there anybody who could help me with something like this? And and they said, oh, there's a little la- old lady up the street. And, and, and he went to her and she had a hole and she opened up her backyard and there was like, nettles like 10 feet high and she made like some of it, she made nettle she made a nettle poultice and it went wow. back in place <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yeah that's a wild blood you know i i heard you mention recently that as you're getting older you actually feel younger you have far less aches and and um achy joints and stuff because of the of the of the um solomon seal right yeah yeah although i was teaching a class recently and i realized also wormwood um in my 50s, I was starting to get sore, uh, stiff all over. You know, the word rheumatism is actually a good word, but it's not scientific nowadays. But but that's, you just feel, oh, oh. And one of my, um, I was given drop doses to somebody of Wormwood, which is a good idea because it's so really, you take one drop, you're like, oh, whoa. Well. I had a student break out in tears and um, just um, a couple of days ago from one drop. And, um, and the whole class is saying, how much did you take? Well, one drop? And, but <clears throat> But uh, at any rate, so um, I had a student who wanted to take more or a client and she, so she got some wormwood and she came to the consult and we made up some wormwood tea and we each took a, a tea, just a, 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 a cup of, of wormwood tea. And that totally got rid of this um, room stiffness everywhere. And about five years later, that started to come back and I took another single cup and gone. So, I mean, which also shows you, I mean, these herbs, they are so incredibly intelligent and can do so much. And and we don't know. I mean, oh, that was one thing Bob Gallagher, the owner of the store, said to me in my first year. The thing about herbalism, you can never know it all. There's always a new leaf to but turn over. That's a beautiful over. quote. And That I mean, one's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. That's so yeah. incredible. You used to tell, I forget the name of this woman, but there was a friend that you had that you were... She was just constantly getting herself into trouble. And you were, every time you'd come back, say, now, who was that, Susan? Was her name Susan? Yeah, Susan. <laughs> and she has a little oh herb goodness. farm, actually. Well, one story that I remember that you told was when she um, she had actually been out much, mushroom foraging. And she had eaten some mushrooms that made her really sick. And you drove her to the hospital. Do you want to tell the story? Yeah, I'll tell that story. Well, it's even crazier than that. Um, she was foraging in her backyard <laughs> and she ate a, um, it was pretty clear. It was a avenging yeah. angel of death, um, Amanita. And it was on the news. Don't let dogs eat it. Don't let your cats eat it. Don't, your, or rather your kids rather. And uh, so it was a nice summer night in August and I got home and I didn't, it was a Saturday night. I don't always answer my phone machine in those days, phone machine, 1992, I think it was. And, um, I didn't always answer, but I thought, oh, better. And there was Susan on the phone. Help, I ate a poison mushroom. So I called her up, and yeah, yeah, she she was lying on the floor. She'd already vomited all that. A friend of hers from the neighborhood had come over. And I said, okay, uh, let's see. Yeah, don't go to the hospital. She didn't want to go anyways. Um, I'll get there. And I had a, I had a third of an ounce thistle. of um, milk thistle seed, just actually the seed. There weren't as many standardized extracts in it, but I didn't have one at any rate. And... Um, and she said, I, and I said, uh, this sounds like fun. <laughs> so, um, and again, you know, by this age, you know, and it was like you, like, put the red flag out. You just didn't, you yes. just had so much confidence in the herbs and, and the spirit of the herbs, spirit of nature that you you weren't afraid. And so I drove to her house and we get, gave her that. And, um, and she was, you know, well, she's only like 80 pounds and she'd vomited probably 15 times or so. So she was pretty cleaned out and exhausted. They said, we better go to the hospital now. We'll take, take you to the hospital. And um, so we bundled her up and put her on the back seat of the car. And it happened that there was a sheet of paper there that was a single sheet of by Stephen Foster of um, use of milk thistle for yeah. Amanita poisoning. So I thought, oh, well, uh, well, you know, so... And on the way to the hospital, so she's in the back seat. She said, I can Ooh. see the other side. And then a couple of blocks later, he said, they're coming to take me. And then as we were coming into the parking lot, she said, it's the right herb. 
<laughs> Paul played her in, and I put the sheet in a whole entry thing. And the evening was unforgettable. We sat for about an hour in the um, waiting room with, you know, in the inner city of the bowels of the inner city in South Minneapolis. And there was a 20, 10, 20, there was 15, 20 other people in there. And I still remember the night because it was the <laughs> night that Pee Wee Herman got busted. So it was all on the news. It was like, and all these people from the other city, like, wow, my life isn't as weird That's as some sure. other people's lives. <laughs> you just, and then the nurse came, like, just a beautiful nurse. She said, your friend is going to be okay. We've taken her upstairs for, we're going to keep her overnight. And um, so Susan said, so they brought her back there and they had heart monitor on her potassium level was going down. She knew a little bit about medicine and, and they were hovering around an orderly, a doctor and the nurse and hovering around and and then all of a sudden and the the heart thing monitor was going crazy and all of a sudden oh. it just went normal <laughs> and they fit him with the dials and they looked at her and, and the nurse picked a, a milk thistle seat off her clothes and said so what's this <laughs> and, and susan said uh uh i, I don't know oh, uh, it's the antidote. I, I, I mean, at this point, it was like out of Harry Potter. You know, it was like, oh, we went to the the the, the regular person's hospital instead of the. <laughs> but so, and they like look at her, you know, and <clears throat> so then they take her up to the room. That's where, and so Paul and I went up, and she'd been there before when she had Crohn's disease for six months, over medicated on opioids, and uh, so she hated that the ICU there. But so they, in fact, they they were going to put her in the same room. She insisted on a different room. But um, so there she is. She's in there sitting on a chair. I don't want to be here. They're they're making me stay here. I I want to go, and they won't make they won't let me smoke. <laughs> and <laughs> Paul and I are sitting there, and then the doctor comes in and he's got like a bunch of sheets of paper, you know, like uh, one of those clipboards. I don't know. They still have them, but they probably are. They I'm sure they don't. Yeah. They do. Oh, they do. Okay, so he he's like looking at it and he says, so "What's going on? What's the problem? What happened?" And and she says, I ate a poison mushroom. And he like, he says like, yeah, where'd you get it? Lunds, like a uh, grocery, grocery store chain. He, he figured she was just a drug OD. And, and um, she said, no, I found it in my backyard. And I could see, this never happened to me any other time, but I, I, I could see these letters over his head. Like his actual thought was, oh my God, this woman's crazy. <laughs> and, and then... And then um, he's going on and on. He says, "Well, this this says you have Crohn's. Like you could you could die any. I mean, you could. This is a fatal disease. You could die any time. What was your doctor? Who is this Crohn's?" And she she says, "No, I know the difference. This is not Crohn's." He accepted that. Who's your doctor? Who's your regular doctor? He said, "Well, uh, I saw uh, Doctor Smith at Park Nicollet a year ago." He says, "What? What? You you haven't been to a doctor for a year. You're supposed to check in oh. once a month. You could die any time." Like, and, and um, that was another. I didn't want to go to the hospital and um, she didn't want to get me in trouble too but she over imagined that and but i could see again what what uh, <laughs> you're supposed to go i i could see the letters over his head and it was oh my god i'm not primary health care provider <laughs> so did he ever know that she took the milk to see did he ever find out yeah and and she had been in the hospital so many times before like, so there's like, in those days, they had paper records. It was a foot and a half high. Um, some years later, her husband, she married, uh, his friend was a doctor, and he, they got her medical records, you know, and, and there was green sheets, which is intensive care unit. And 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 his, his I'll just end the story here, because she's such an amazing person. His uh, His friend says, wow, I've never seen so many with, somebody with so many green sheets who who was still alive <laughs> it's like we'd have to shoot her to try to get rid of her oh oh i see somebody oh, already tried that <laughs> she had a gunshot i used to think that you made her up actually because every time you'd come back to you know school or i'd see you at any conference i'd always hear another susan story but you know the thing that's really remarkable is that in europe they keep milk thistle extract you know it's like the only thing that's known to counteract mushroom poisoning so you probably did save her life that day, you know? I mean, really. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And um, then there's a little Indian craft store in South Minneapolis. And 
it's just a coincidence. So I told a bunch of people, and my friend, the proprietress of that store, she was telling somebody over the front desk, and a woman walked up from the back of the store, and she said, I'm an emergency room nurse at Abbott Northwestern Hospital, and, and my best friend was the one who handled that case, and we got some we got some milk thistle, and we have it in our locker. And my friend said, well, you could lose your license for using that. And she said, I'd rather oh, lose my license than a patient. Yeah, so, of course. Yeah. I mean, it's so simple, but it sounds so yeah, powerful. Right. Well, Matthew, I can't believe it. We're coming close to the end of our time together. And I could I could just listen to your stories forever, honestly. And I, I have. I know your stories. And I know that there's – I actually – can validate them because I've seen so many of them that are, you know, of the people that you've helped and worked with. But I did want to ask you a couple more questions. One is, I noticed that I didn't really know about this. I think mostly because I'm traveling and teaching so much, but that you started your own herb school, the Matthew Wood Institute of Herbalism. Can you share with me a little bit about that? Yeah, well, that's online. And even though I love to travel, I got many planets in the ninth house for travel, um, astrology wise, but, um, one has to, well, with COVID, one had to settle down. Ed. So uh, we're trying to have an herb program online, and um, we're still, it, to do it right, it's just taken, well, really a year of working consistently on the first year program, or maybe a year and a half, whereas before that, we, we were just collecting classes for about four or five years. Um, I'd just speak once a month, and then we'd have some special classes. Phyllis Light and I are mostly um, working together on that, and a few other people here and there. Um, and sometimes it's just whatever nice. topics we feel like talking about. Um, at the beginning of COVID, we did one on the respiratory tract because that was really timely. And we, Phyllis and I love teaching organ systems in that. Well, you did. I think Phyllis and I taught yeah. one time at your, yeah, your place. Yeah, very special so, weekend. Yeah, yeah. So we're a natural, uh, when we get together, we're uh, yeah, online even, yeah. So um so yeah, it's just uh, so we have an enormous number of classes, and we do have a discount for people, your students, people watching this, and um, uh, so you can look up Matthew Wood Institute of Herbalism dot com. I think is what you can do. <clears throat> of course, my books are out there, and uh, I'm uh, yeah the last one, the Holistic uh, Medicine and the Extracellular Matrix. I wanted really, to um, that. is a really good book. I wanted to the mention foundation that book for just a moment you... because I had the privilege of reviewing it, Matthew, and I felt it was like one of the most powerful books that has come out in years. Um, and I, you know, I, I'm concerned that a lot of herbalists don't know about it, you know, because it's just it's un, it's not your usual, you know, herb book in the sense that we're looking at herbal remedies for whatever. Do you mind speaking about that book? I I was blown out when I read way when I read that book. So. Would you mind speaking about it for a moment? The extracellular matrix is all the stuff inside here between the capillary and the cell, which is, I don't, you know, the inner ocean. I don't know, it's 70% of the body, something like that. And, uh, and of course, uh, or all the liquids are 70%. And um, it is, and it conditions the cell's life. The cell is totally controlled by the matrix. The matrix tells it to eat, to to uh, eliminate, to migrate, to um, procreate even. The cell does not replicate without information from the matrix. So the matrix is the brains of the cell. And as I say in the book, this is such a great line, um, it's, not the, it's not the nucleus, that's the genitals of the cell. That's the reproductive organ. And we humans always get our brains and our genitals mixed up. <laughs> so we don't really understand. We don't really understand this. And it seems impossible, but the environment of the cell controls the cell. And that's what's important. And that is now modern science. And it has disproved the cell theory. It's disproved the whole idea of modern medicine of that to get the molecule to hit the receptor, the lead to to cure through the through the cell. That's outmoded. That's about 30 years out of date now. And little by little, medicine will change to knowledge of the matrix treating to correct them. The environment of the cell is a more profound way and more correct way. And I do give some, and of course, so so our mucilages and our astringents act particularly, not, not just on the membranes, yeah. but deep into the matrix, as well as some other stuff. And I do go across some some herbs for that. I'd, I'd say, I to give an example, I never understood chickweed until I understood the matrix. And I realized, oh, 
That's why it works so well externally and almost better externally than any other way. It just works. It's it's penetrates into the matrix. Yeah. Um, I have seen, it's kind of like I chose the wrong word. The word uh, interstitium is more coming into use in um, uh, medicine in the last couple of years. In American medicine, maybe it may be different, German medicine. And I, so I picked the wrong word. That's what they're talking about yeah. to the um, I like that word the matrix, matrix actually. So, yeah, it's a powerful, yeah. wonderful book. And um, all of your books are published. What's the publishing company that publishes those your books? That one's now published by Inner oh, Traditions. Great. The other ones are published awesome. by North Atlantic Press. Yeah. Yeah. And I have one on pulse diagnosis I self published with Lulu publications. Yeah. We have links on our website to uh, Matthew, or Matthew that yeah. people will be able to link and. I also have a full bio. I never, whenever I introduce my beloved friends, I always just kind of take snippets, but there's so much about, so much richness about the work you've done. So I'd like to just finish with um, just one last question is, in all the things that you've done in herbal work these last, what, 40 something years, what is it that you're most proud of, at least at this moment? You know, like, what is it that you can look back and just feel the best about? Well, that astrologer, (laughs) she said, you will never feel complete until you have published a book, written a book. And I knew instantly that was a book that became the Book of Herbal Wisdom. I knew I had to write it <clears throat> when I was finished. It was like, thank goodness. And 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 the rest of my life was gravy. Like, um, even though that's maybe been superseded in knowledge-wise by other books and other knowledge, that was the thing I had to write, showing that plants had a definite sort of identity pattern and personality and in fact, it was an astrologer then who said, oh, I was about 55 or 50, so it was many years later. I was about 32 then when I wrote that. And she said, so have you completed your life work? And I said, yeah, I guess I have. You know, astrologers, they just can see into you sometimes. <laughs> and, and, and she said, yeah, it's like you lead like oh. the life of Riley. <laughs> like, I can just tell you just don't have that burning inner thing to, you know, I'm still doing all the things I do since then. I'll build on that and continue that. But but uh, that was kind of the crucial mm-hmm. thing. I had to do that. I had to get that book out. And I, and I do have to say then when I wrote The Earthwise Herbal, it got so I could just read the constituents and look at a picture. I could just understand what it was for and even if I hadn't used it, like acacia, I remember writing the acacia. I thought, I understand this plant. It's, it's I don't know. Yeah. So I have fulfilled and still going on. I mean, that's kind you're of neat. You're always doing you know? new things, so. though. You're you're always fulfilling <laughs> the right. next, you know. So we, yeah, it, it's yeah. incredible. Well, thank you, Matthew, so much for joining yeah. us and just sharing. I know that really I've heard so many of your stories and I, I just wish we had another hour. Maybe I'll invite you back on again because I I do love listening to your stories and I'm so appreciative of all the work you've done for all of us. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have to say, I had every single case history memorized until I wrote the book of Herbal Wisdom. And then after that, I can hardly remember any of them. So, so, um, I, I, I don't have as many good stories as I was. <laughs> well, some of them are in your fingers. books, you know, <laughs> like they're tucked in your books. And also a lot of them are tucked in your friends like me. Yes. We have the stories. So it's good to, that we're all sharing them. Well, thank you, sweetie. Thank you so much. I am thankful to be here. I am thankful.